Well, good morning and welcome. Delighted to have you with us for this incredibly important conversation we have today. I'm Chuck Robertson. I am the canon to the presiding bishop for ministry beyond the Episcopal Church and have the privilege of being able to work with both our Office of Government Relations in Washington, D.C., with our Office of Representation to the United Nations out of New York, and also with Episcopal Migration Ministries, a ministry of many decades that, along with its other fellow affiliates, has been speaking and working and doing all that is possible to help in this latest crisis as we are seeing the evacuation of Afghan uh, allies uh, of ours uh, and, and also working throughout the world with refugees, asylum seekers. This conversation today is an important one. You saw the title of this, Doing Well by Our Allies, and that is the question. Will we do well by our allies, and how can we ensure that? Because the situation is dire. The situation is difficult and horrific, and it is upon us to find ways as society and as churches to be able to feel out how we can make a difference and how we can extend a truly welcoming arm as well as providing ongoing advocacy for the situation that continues and in many ways uh, for the increasing violence and hurt and pain that is being experienced. You'll hear quite a bit about that today, both from, uh, from two panelists who have much to say and great experience in this area from different, different, uh, different pieces, different points of view. I hope you will be able to enjoy and uh, take, take this education you get today and run with it. Find ways to be a part of the advocacy with your own senators and congresspersons. Find ways to reach out and to figure out on the ground with churches and congregations how we can make a difference, what we can do on the local level. Now I want to introduce Chris Ramon, who is with us in our uh, refugee and immigration advocacy work on the Hill through the Episcopal Church's uh, Office of Government Relations. Chris, thank you so much for moderating this time. Um, I turn it over to you, and if you would introduce our two esteemed panelists. Thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Chris Ramon, and uh, you know I don't want to take up too much of your time because we obviously are here to hear from our wonderful panelists. Um, but in order to provide some context, um, it's 26 years since the United States left Vietnam and the evacuation that we carried out at that time, culminating in that very iconic image of the CIA officer leading uh, Vietnamese onto the helicopter on, um, on the, actually the top of an apartment building. It wasn't the U.S. Embassy, it was an apartment building that was used by U.S. Um, officials. And, you know, since that time, what you've seen is that the United States has sort of taken two, two developments that have been positive. Uh, in 1980, the United States created the refugee program and the asylum program to be able to provide humanitarian protection uh, to individuals seeking uh, safety here in the United States. Um, you know, the, the United States has actually also created a special uh, visa category for Afghan and Iraqi allies, and we'll be talking about that later today. Um, and gender and women's rights and girls' rights has also become a component of U.S. foreign policy um, as the days, decades have moved on since 1975. But unfortunately, and this is why we're here today, is that despite the fact that we have invested these resources and we have made this focus on our foreign policy, we are on the precipice uh, and probably actually are already in the middle of a major humanitarian catastrophe in Afghanistan. And the question now is not so much um, how we can try to sort of prevent what's gonna be happening. Uh, the question now is really mitigating this. And I think the important thing for you all, as Ken Chuck said, is you may feel a sense of helplessness, but the purpose of this webinar is to equip you with the knowledge and the understanding to be able to make your voices heard, your church's voices heard, in order to ensure that we are gonna be doing well by our allies. So with that said, I'm now gonna be turning to our panelists. Um, our first panelist is Krish Omera Vinaraja. Uh, she's the president and CEO of Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service. Um, 
Krish previously served uh, in the Obama White House as policy director for First Lady Michelle Obama uh, and the State Department as senior advisor under uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, when she was at the White House, uh, she led the First Lady's signature Let Girls Learn initiative. So thinking about that foreign policy angle that I was talking about, um, Krish holds a BS in molecular biology and an MA in political science from Yale College. She has a JD from Yale Law School and a master's in philosophy and international relations from Oxford University, where she was a Marshall Fellow. And we also are very happy to have uh, Rahela Siddiqui, who's the founder and the director of the Rahela Trust for uh, Afghan Women's Education and the CEO for Global Governance and Reform Advisory. She is also the member of the steering committee of Afghanistan Mechanism for Inclusive Peace and honorary uh, deputy chair for Afghan Diaspora Unity Council. Um, Rahela is one of the founders of the National Solidarity Program of Afghanistan and Community Forum. Uh, she's also a former senior advisor of UN Habitat and the Independent Administrator for Forum and Civil Service Commission of Afghanistan. Uh, she has a master's in development and sustainable livelihood from Reading University of the UK. So we are now just going to start and just jump right in. Um, so the first round of questions is just the current challenges that the United States you know, that we face with the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. And Chris, um, you know, can you, so I talked about this a little bit earlier, I just mentioned to it. Can you explain what the Special Immigrant Visa Program is and who are, who are our Afghan allies and the challenges that they're facing, um, you know, with relation to this particular program? Yeah, um, Chris, uh, thank you for that question. And before I jump right in, let me also thank the Episcopal Church Office of Government Relations um, for hosting this event to, you know, discuss such a critical and obviously um, very timely issue. Uh, so to speak to your first question, um, for two decades, the U.S. government has employed Afghan allies to serve really alongside U.S. troops, um, diplomats, other government employees. Um, those roles have ranged from uh, interpreters, translators, cultural advisors, uh, drivers, and other such roles. But, but because of their service to the U.S. mission, um, our allies and their families soon become the targets of anti-American violence. So the Special Immigrant Visa, or SIV program, um, it began in 2006. And what it does is it provides a direct pathway to permanent U.S. residency, um, also known as a green card. Uh, so the organization that I lead, LIRS, has resettled more than 9,000 SIV recipients um, since the program began. So it has, you know, some history, this program. So when Afghan wartime allies are approved by the government for resettlement in the U.S., um, our experts provide really vital welcome services, um, you know, during those first few weeks for during those first few months to ensure that they receive a warm welcome, uh, firm footing um, as they build a new life uh, here in a new country. So LIRS and its volunteers will provide uh, modest furniture, um, a stock pantry of culturally familiar foods, and, and really the basic amenities of an American home. And then over the course of those next few months, case managers will support the individual or family in learning to navigate their new home. Um, adults are enrolled in English language classes. Uh, children are enrolled in school. And case managers will guide the families in everything from uh, public transportation um, to accessing community resources. So case managers will support our new neighbors in learning uh, financial literacy um, will help them find a job or a vocational calling. Um, they're also introduced to new neighbors and churches and community groups that will play obviously an important role in providing each refugee family with support and companionship um, for you know really years to come. Um, you know, but now as the U.S. Armed Forces um, have, uh, you know, planned to evacuate uh, Afghanistan and leave, depart uh, by August 31st. More than 20,000 Afghans who served alongside them face a severe backlog in the processing of their special immigrant visas. So our Afghan allies and their families are in grave danger and at risk of retaliatory attacks from the Taliban. And unfortunately, many have already tragically lost their lives. Um, so this emergency is exacerbated by the escalating security situation on the ground. Um, I feel like every day, right, we are getting these news alerts of Taliban forces 
quickly gaining control of the country's provinces, um, you know, as, as you mentioned as well. Um, many of our Afghan allies who risked their lives in service to the U.S. mission are now in hiding or attempting to flee to relative safety in Kabul, uh, where the only secure airfield for evacuation flights is located. Um, LIRS partners estimate that more than 50 percent of SIV applicants and their families live outside of Kabul. So that is a grave concern right now. How are they going to get from those location through Taliban checkpoints to Kabul? How are they going to be able to go to the one location to actually be evacuated? So I recently wrote an op-ed for CNN about Sohail Pardis, um, a former interpreter from the United States who was on his way to pick up his sister in Afghan's coast province um, for Eid celebrations. Um, when he reached a Taliban-controlled checkpoint along his route to Kabul. And um, villagers witnessed Taliban militants drag Pardis out of his vehicle and behead him. Um, these are the impossible stories to hear, but everyone needs to understand time is running out. Um, and that's why we're here today. Um, so let me just end by just saying, you know, LRS has been on the front lines of this issue. Um, we've been calling for the immediate ev evacuation of the 20,000 SIV applicants and more than 58,000 family members from Afghanistan to US soil. Um, and while it is heartening that, you know, we have uh, almost 700 SIV applicants that have arrived to Fort Lee in Virginia, we've barely scratched the surface. Um, just yesterday, the U.S. announced that there will be 3,000 troops sent back to Afghanistan to safeguard the movement of civilian personnel, as well to help process these SIVs. Um, we are grateful, obviously, for the assurances, but it's unfortunate that this urgency has only been spurred um, in the last few weeks, knowing that this has been a dire situation over the last several months. And, you know, this has obviously been a deployment of 20 years. So we really do remain concerned about these Afghan allies. Um, you know, we can, we're concerned about whether they will be evacuated to Qatar. Uh, Qatar is a country that is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention, and they don't assure freedom of expression or movement. Um, so that is why we firmly believe that these individuals need to be moved to U.S. territory, um, and, and that's where I do think that we have an opportunity to evacuate them to a place like Guam. Anything less than a full evacuation of these allies and family members would be a complete abdication of our moral responsibility, and so we will not stand down until every single one of them um, and their family members are evacuated to a place of safety on U.S. soil. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah. And, and for those at home, LIRS has been leading a multi-partner coalition on this um, that brings in veteran groups, faith groups, uh, refugee groups. It's been really amazing to sort of see how this has really been uh, spanning the ideological partisan and po policy divide. Um, so that's very much appreciated. Um, Rahela, we're, so, you know, I was talking about, you know, U.S. foreign policy sort of developing a gender, a women's rights, girls' rights component over these decades. But unfortunately, the withdrawal of U.S. forces um, from Afghanistan raises a lot of implications about what's going to be happening to Afghan women and girls uh, before, you know, as the United States is withdrawing and what's going to be happening afterwards. So can you just give us a sense of what's happening on the ground on that? Um, thank you, President. Thank you for organizing this such an in-time um, event. I would say that before withdrawal of, withdrawal of the U.S. Uh, force, um, women were facing challenges in Afghanistan. Uh, of course, there was legal framework like constitution, civil service law, women, uh, labor law, and, uh, and uh, all other legal framework, and also international treaties like CEDAW and uh, 1325. But Still, implementation was uh, challenges, uh, especially in conservative area and and, uh, and uh, rural area of Afghanistan. Uh, there, women were facing. I mean, you know that Afghanistan was one of the worst places to for women to live in uh, uh, world record. Like forced marriage and early marriage is uh, there. Uh, violence against women at the family and uh, society level or there, and also in the working environment, according to the UN report, 87% uh, of women face one type of uh, violence, and uh, women at the young women at the secondary school uh, dropped from 40% to 20%. 
even before the withdrawal, but you, you can imagine that how much it dropped now that there might be no one going to uh, schools under uh, Taliban control. Um, girls' schools were burned or closed. And, uh, but after the withdrawal uh, announcement, uh, the situation has uh, gotten to, to very uh, worse uh, situation now. And 13 million of uh, population of women and children uh, particularly uh, don't access to basic services in, in the country. And based on the UNAMA report on the 15th July, 18 million people are in severe uh, need of emergency food and live in, in poverty. Um, civil servants are displaced, uh, 4,000 civil servants, uh, 50,000 of officers are closed, more, mostly for women, uh, uh, people in the rural area, I mean, how can I say it? People uh, uh, harvested crops have been uh, uh, burned, uh, like yesterday in uh, in, uh, in Ghazni. Uh, radio TV TV stations were burned in places under control of Taliban, like in in Ghors, for example. Um, women have lack access to go to uh, to uh, without mahram going out of womb in many provinces that they have occupied, like in Ghazni or is gone. Uh, name it so many provinces that they have occupied. Um, they are not able to go with ma mahram. They are uh, not able to go to work. Uh, neither, of course, to school. And uh, seven had a targeted uh, assassination have been happened, including the women judge, women teachers, students, journalists activists. So in short, I would say that the Taliban continues to intimidate every educated professional uh, woman in Afghanistan. The violence uh, women suffers in Afghanistan is constant uh, against a backdrop of the revenge of uh, COVID-19 and poverty. Uh, unfortunately, the aid was uh, uh, reduced by 20% at the Geneva Conference last year and was looking to all these catastrophic situations. Yangal, in the area that were uh, under control of Taliban, widows and young uh, girls were abducted from uh, places under control of Taliban. For example, in Herat, they called in masjid, uh, that they asked mullahs to call the young women and young girls to uh, uh, to get the assistance, and uh, with that name, the women came, poor women who were living in poverty, widows and young women who lived in poverty, they came to the Masjid of Herat, and then they were uh, abducted for Jihad al -Nikah. This is by active observer of our activists in the, in the, in the field. Likewise, in the Samangan, on the way to, uh, from uh, Polinakshi to, uh, to Mazar Sharif, uh, two husbands uh, were bit beaten by uh, very hardly and their uh, uh, wives were abducted and in front of them their husband were first beat hardly beaten hardly and then their wife were abducted a mother uh, a daughter a daughter of a woman was taken the same in the same area this is this is in just early august uh, when i'm speaking with you and when the mother was screaming and they just uh, uh, shot it the mothers and then abducted the girls. So in, uh, in, in, in Badakhshan, I mean, in the slide that I have put these links, that can show you that uh, in the links that a mother in Badakhshan is screaming that her daughter, two daughters were taken from uh, her house by the Taliban in the coffin. Uh, and the, first of all, they were unconscious and then they were taken. And uh, when uh, the brother was, trying to take the hand of the daughter, the, her sisters, they, they shot at it. Uh, these cases are, I mean, yesterday in, in, in Ghazni, a young uh, boy who was uh, on motorcycle, she, he just had the flag of the tree color uh, flag on her motors and his motorcycle. They just say that, okay, go ahead, close, and then shot it on his head. And she was just dropped off from her motorcycle and, and lost uh, her life. Horrific, horrific, horrific situation. Uh, how can I explain? I get emotional. I'm trying to, to, to control myself in Badakhshan and Ghazni and Uruzgan and Baglan and Paktia and Kapisa, Tagop uh, district. These uh, cases of ab abduction 
by date by people numbers are recorded uh, by the ob active observers. Um, and I hope there's a day that it will be shown by uh, uh, on video by uh, to the to the to the public. Thousands of innocent young, uh, educated, wise uh, 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 or killed in uh, in in these. Uh, uh, I was. It is horrific to show the pictures of the so many of genocide. And uh, because it is, it's traumatized. And uh, uh, I can say that when uh, uh, Reynolds Newman, the, uh, the 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 former ambassador of uh, Afghanistan uh, of U.S. in Afghanistan, who said that um, I think this U U.S. Secretary uh, uh, State. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken uh, promised that when we leave Afghanistan, we'll be in a better position. But what he said, and I people we can observe, on the contrary, unfortunately, Afghanistan is not in a better position. And uh, when the troop left, for example, one example I can give: uh, the the allies of the the contractors who were doing the maintenance of the many uh, equipments, like tank or tog or the uh, helicopters or uh, whatever means of war that they were using tools, uh, they were needed maintenance and the uh, uh, Afghan uh, security force were not trained well to be able to do it. So this is one of, one of, one of the examples. Uh, so the situation is so <sighs> catastrophic and uh, it is horrifying and uh, uh, woman, you're saying, uh, um, Krish, about the uh, alloys of 20,000. I would say there are people who were plumber, who were mechanical, who were uh, uh, at a very simple contractor of the uh, US program, a woman in particular, even people who gain tra training from the US program, probably to, uh, from other, other uh, Western. Uh, countries, there will be in, in danger. I think yesterday uh, there was a case that a, uh, uh, a translator from Kandahar, he was just trying to get his, did you hear this uh, this message? I'm not sure if you heard uh, to her house, all the work was finished, I think. And he was trying to take his, this was his story just I heard, uh, to take her husband and family on the way to the check post of Taliban, he was killed, he was beheaded. But before he arrived to his home, his family was already, all of the family were, were killed. This is the news of yesterday I, I heard from people in the, in the, in the ground, but you may hear uh, later. So I will stop here. Uh, there are so many cases, but I will stop here and, and yeah, speak later. Yeah. Um... No, thank you for that. And that brings us to round two, which is what's the US response to these challenges. Um, so Krish, um, you know, there are some pros and there's some cons. Uh, you know, rarely do we ever see Congress actually do anything on immigration proactive these days. Um, but there has been some positive developments in Congress about uh, supporting the, um, the processing of SIVs, um, you know, looking at uh, an emergency supplemental bill that was passed, for instance, um, and the, the administration is doing some some things on front of, of uh, P2 um, designations. So can you can you kind of dig into a little bit about what we're seeing with the U.S. response so far? Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll start with the executive branch and then talk a little bit about what we're seeing um, in Congress. So. In late June, um, President Biden announced uh, what uh, he called Operation Allies Refuge. Um, so this is the official relocation plan for those Afghan allies who serve the US military and their families. Um, about two weeks ago, uh, on July 30th, um, as I mentioned, uh, we saw uh, the first movements of families to Fort Lee where uh, this, these sets of individuals were essentially at the tail end of the refugee processing system. Um, so 
They were, uh, uh, you know, charter flights um, arrived at Dulles, went to Fort Lee. Vast, vast majority of them are now at their final destination. Uh, many of them will move into the Northern Virginia region, um, uh, California, Texas, a few other locations. Um, I had actually the chance to meet with them and beyond Fort Lee, uh, the base um, uh, last week. And it was, you know, incredible to see um, the hope in their faces. Um, but, you know, it is such a sad few um, who are getting this relief. Um, so, you know, when Rahela mentions uh, innumerable, I mean, too many uh, horrific um, accounts of, of, of murder, um, you know, and, and genocide, I do think that this is, um, you know, it's, it's just a sad reality of, of what we are talking about of, of the people who have arrived, tiny fraction of the people who need um, to be relocated. So there are literally tens of thousands who have submitted uh, the needed documentation for their application. And so they're waiting for further instructions from the US government. And obviously that is happening during a severely deteriorating security situation in Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, we are waiting to see what will happen. Um, you know, the expectation is that there will be a significant ramp up of more of these SIVs and families who are coming to the US. Um, but it is important to note, you know, as Rahela gave the example of a, of a plumber, um, you know, SIVs have to meet a, a very kind of stringent set of requirements um, to be a SIV, a special immigrant visa. You have to have worked for the US government for two years. Um, so, uh, you know, the gentleman I mentioned who was beheaded, uh, he had worked for the U.S. for 18 months. Um, and that bureaucratic um, cutoff should not be the basis for uh, whether someone gets to live or die. I mean, that is just the simple truth. Um, the State Department also did expand um, the refugee resettlement program to include um, individuals who worked with a USAID contractor, for example. So um, the head of F FHI 360, who still has programs in Afghanistan, and I wrote an op-ed for The Hill to talk about how um, you know, the, the focus on SIVs is obviously critically important, but there is a much larger population there who did work in service of our US mission over two decades and we cannot forget them. Um, and, and, you know, and, and of course, I, you know, that is not to say that we should ignore um, the, the Afghan kind of civilians that Rahel is um, describing. We, we are just dishonestly, we're trying to figure out a way to coherently think through how we can help and, and how to approach that. Um, uh, in terms of Congress, um, you know, we are seeing, uh, Chris, as you mentioned, um, some, some heartening action. Um, Congress has been working to speed up the process for SIV applicants and their families. So the Emergency Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2021, which was originally introduced by Senator Leahy, overwhelmingly passed both houses of Congress and was signed into law on July 30, 30th. Um, so the law includes some key provisions uh, for the improvement of the Afghan SIV program. Um, uh, a couple that I'll, I'll mention. Um, one, it increases the number of authorized visas uh, by 8,000. Um, it does decrease the eligibility requirement to one year. Um, it allows for the deferral of the required medical examination um, to expedite visa issuances. So for example, some of the individuals that I met with on the Fort Lee base had basically done everything, but they were just doing the medical exams. Um, I actually got lost when I first arrived at the base and I actually walked through the, the medical um, unit and a, a nurse joked with me about, oh, I, you know, you're lost, but I can trick you. So I was like, let me find the legal area that I needed to be at. So, um, you know, so there, there we are some, seeing some flexibility that Congress is trying to create. Um, they also provided 100 million for emergency aid for Afghan refugees. Um, and then lastly, on August 2nd, as I said, um, the Biden administration did create this P2 status. Um, and so it will allow for additional relief to those um, who could qualify. Um, and so, you know, th those are some vital steps, but, uh, you know, I'll just end by saying, um, while we are making some baby steps in the right direction, it is not with the urgency that we need. Um, as you all know that there are countless journalists, teachers, um, you know, as Rahela described, women's rights activists, um, civil society leaders who have 
uh, you know, worked alongside of us um, who deeply believe in the ideals that we uh, fought for and their lives are in jeopardy as a result. So while LRS has applauded uh, President Biden um, for acknowledging the humanitarian imperative, uh, we need to do more. Um, there has been significant action, but the fact still remains that these brave people risk everything for the U.S. mission. Um, we can't leave them behind, and that's why LRS continues to call for the complete immediate evacuation to U.S. soil. One quick follow-up question there. What is the backlog of SIVs for Afghans? Yeah, so we have um, in total about 100,000. So it's uh, almost 18,000 SIVs and 83,000 family members. And that's within kind of the, the traditional definition of two years of service. Um, it would massively expand if we were talking about that lowering the threshold to one year. Yeah, and that should give folks at home the, at the scope of what we are doing things, but that gives you the sense of how much more we need to do. Um, and uh, so Rahela, you know, you're thinking about the U.S. response. Where have you seen the U.S. response on addressing, you know, um, the rights of women and, and girls? Um, what are sort of concrete things that you've seen them do on this? Okay. If I could ask uh, Lindsay to put my slides here when I'm talking, but I will start. Uh, I think um, there was good contribution in terms of uh, financial resources and eight uh, support to Afghanistan, nine billion US dollars spent in a war in Afghanistan and $132 billion uh, were spent in uh, development uh, program in Afghanistan based on CIGAR report. Um, uh, although it was not uh, uh, very strategically and systematized uh, with systematized plan of using efficient uh, financial uh, resources uh, uh, and, and therefore corruptions and uh, narcotic have been affected the development process. Nonetheless, constitution and a huge legal framework have been uh, developed during this, uh, 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 before the withdrawal of the, of the US and uh, women increase in leaderships. And if I could have the second slide, please. Uh, Lindsay, next slide, please. Um, if you click on it, it will, Click on it, please. On, if you click on it, yeah. Yeah, it will come. Thank you. Um, as you can see uh, here from the ambassadors uh, to uh, support uh, to 40% in school, uh, 4,000 uh, in army, uh, 3,000 in police and uh, uh, in sports in uh, art and 22% at university, 22% in uh, several service, uh, service machinery of the government and many leaders like uh, you can see the yellow scarf, uh, the director of uh, uh, cinema and uh, human rights and uh, in many leadership positions, you can see a uh, lady of ambassador of United States and also the UN uh, position of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and many ambassadors here, you can see. So they were all the uh, result of the uh, two decades investment of the international force and uh, mainly particularly um, United States, of course. 40% um, uh, women uh, girls are in education and around, at, as I said, at the university as well, 22%. Um, there was also uh, the U.S. contribution for, in, in terms of uh, women leadership capacity building uh, to pro, uh, promote projects. 75,000 young girls were uh, trained in a, with a very good skills, including our scholars uh, who could be the very good uh, future leader of Afghanistan. Uh, let alone that uh, with uh, several society organizations and another uh, uh, leadership uh, project with the private sectors. Uh, uh, and uh, so these are in terms of all the 
contribution. I'm just saying some some of the examples, and uh, there are so many women in uh, uh, award winner of the activities or skills that they never practiced in the in the in the past, uh, like acrobat, like uh, football uh, uh, champion, like uh, karate champion, and 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 the list goes beyond. Can I go to the next? And also women in parliament, 27%. And uh, yeah, and uh, lots of businesses and women in art and music. This is the first time that women who are in a very uh, uh, massive numbers, they are in, in, in music and art and, uh, uh, and cinema and women who are driving, women who are... Um, uh, many women were in business, and you can see from the pictures, the beautiful pictures, that how uh, uh, the lives were in the process of changing toward the democracy, but it was a step to democracy. Uh, but now we are in a catastrophic situation. Can I go to the next, uh, next one, please? Um, yeah, so, uh, but I should say that, can I, can, can you please uh, click on that? Yeah, thank you. I should say that, uh, unfortunately, I'm disappointed, not me, the citizens are disappointed. And it is a shock situation. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we have been, uh, 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 the international community and particularly uh, United States was given too much, too much leg legitimacy to Taliban. And government was undermined, government and institutions. And now we can see that in this time of vacation, summer vacation times for our other world citizens, Afghan people are burning and Afghanistan is in burn uh, right now. No Afghan woman wants to leave Afghanistan. No Afghan woman wants to leave Afghanistan. Her home, her life, her uh, work, her interests, uh, uh, and that they wanted to provide services. Uh, but the situation is, uh, we have to know that the situation is worse and the Taliban is even worse than previous, brutal and hateful and vengeful that women may not want to live in this kind of situation. And women who, gain uh, progressive uh, advancement in this last uh, two decades. And now they have been, uh, I know that there is a platform now and that we are hearing that there is visa uh, processing and special immigration visa processing. Um, but it is, unfortunately, it is little and it is inaccessible. And uh, I should say that I am so worried about those women who were gaining training by you is only for uh, two weeks. And uh, I can give you examples of uh, our uh, activists that he was, she was saying that I'm going to destroy all my certificate that I got from you is uh, through uh, training. And I'm going to uh, destroy my uh, certificate of award that they have given for my volunteer work. Can you imagine? that how horrific situation or for the women, and we are talking about one year of the uh, services for the, I would, I don't know, I don't know if the, 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 the if there's any advocacy for lowering down this and, uh, and looking to the women's situation in Afghanistan to change this, uh, this policy. Um, uh, also, I would I, I would say that um, we need to accurately define the situation, and this could be what next Ravanda. Let's not wait until it happens, and let's prevent it. Let us give meaning to never again. It's also vital to mention that all Afghan citizens want peace, but which peace? We want the inclusive peace, we want sustainable peace. We want peace with fair and justice. But the situation now is, is not for peace, has killing, distractions, abductions, sexual abuse, 
is going on. And unless there is a complete ceasefire and comprehensive, comprehensive ceasefire, I would stop here, uh, Chris, thank you. Yeah, and this leads to the last round of questions and, and you, you, you just teed it up very well, um, which is what the U.S. can do uh, and what um, members of the Episcopal Church can do um, and concerned Americans and concerned citizens of the world, because it's not just simply, you know, a, a U.S. problem. Um, I think there are a lot of people around the world who are rightfully very concerned about this. So, Krish, so what does the United States need to do to maximize protection for Afghan allies and their families as the military withdraws from Afghanistan? And where do you see the role that the Episcopal Church members can play here? Yeah, um, I, I appreciate the question because I really do think that, um, and I'm seeing it even in the chat box, I appreciate um, so many asking what you can do. And uh, I'll be candid, um, there's a lot for us to do. Um, and I think that you can help. The security situation is essentially out of control. Um, the stories that Rahela shared, uh, and, and thank you so much for being so candid, Rahela, in terms of um, those stories are the same stories uh, or similar to ones that we hear nearly every day um, from our partners on the ground of uh, allies, of um, civilians, uh, citizens being located and murdered by the Taliban. Um, and even with the latest announcements, the situation is uh, incredibly bleak. Um, you know, the U.S. government has said that Kabul will likely fall to the Taliban within 90 days, and that is optimistic because, um, you know, based on the trend lines we're seeing, um, it could be well before that. Um, but while it may feel uh, hopeless, um, uh, you know, I, I think we can't kind of give up hope. It, it's just, we can't, right? Um, so LRS has been engaged with this issue, um, you know, since President Biden announced the US's withdrawal. Um, and while you can probably sense from my comments here today, uh, those steps are insufficient for the size of the population. Um, they are significant and they should give us hope that we can move the needle on this issue. Um, neither Congress nor the president us usually moves quickly, um, but it is a sign that uh, we have seen some impact um, in the announcements and that is thanks to the tireless advocacy um, out there. So that's where the Episcopal Church can come in. Um, LRS has set up an action alert on our website that allows supporters to send messages urging immediate evacuation um, to both President Biden as well as members of Congress. And you know, Chris, as you mentioned, this is a bipartisan issue. And so you can, wherever you are located in this country, you can have an impact. Um, you know, each week we hold a social media um, a kind of Twitter storm calling for the White House to act and to act more quickly. Um, individually, we ask members of the church to spread awareness about this issue and educate friends, families, neighbors, congregations about the desperate situation facing our allies. We, may, we need to make this tangible. We need to make this personal. Um, I, you can probably sense, I will continue to be vocal and sharp about this issue because that is what we have to do. Um, you know, diplomacy has its moments and, and just candor of how this is an abominable situation and it's unacceptable is um, just, I think, what we need to do. So, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to share my social media handle, but, um, you know, regularly we're putting out calls and we're highlighting and informing. Um, so you can follow me in, on, on, on Twitter and Facebook. It's just my at Krish Vignaraja. Um, it means so much to me today that you're here to hear about what's happening. Um, and that is where I think we do need to continue to put pressure on our government. Um, there are also many ways to get involved in terms of actually supporting um, those lucky families, individuals who have arrived on our soil. And candidly, we're going to see a significant uptick of that in the next 10 days. I was on a call with the State Department uh, even an hour ago. Um, and that's where we're going to need your help. Um, LIRS has seen an unprecedented number of what we call SIV walk-in clients. So these are people who have received their visas and have traveled to the U.S. on their own instead of through kind of the typical diplomatic channels. So when our Afghan allies and their families arrive, they often have little um, with them, um, sometimes just the clothes on their backs. Um, so many have no money, nowhere to stay, nothing to eat. 
Obviously, affordable housing is a critical issue right now. So, um, you know, typically there's a five to seven day gap between when these families arrive and when they're eligible to receive any sort of services. I know there was a question about a stipend. Um, there is some basic cash assistance, but there is that window of about a week when we are really kind of just paying out of pocket um, in order to help them. So you can be involved in that process. Um, LIRS started the Neighbors in Need Fund. Um, this is uh, for Afghan allies, and it provides for sort of basic necessities. Um, and so we invite anyone who is able to support that fund. Uh, for our allies who have come through Fort Lee, um, we're currently working hard to meet the influx of need. So our partners have asked for volunteers to support. Um, uh, so, you know, there are locations like Seattle, Tacoma, um, the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, uh, Houston, Fort Worth. Um, so if you or someone you know are in those areas, please do get in touch with us. Um, and then I'll kind of wrap up by saying if you're able to volunteer your time, um, you may be able to help us with airport pickups, apartment setups, bringing a meal. Um, you might be able to sign up there. Uh, you know, so we can certainly share some of those um, opportunities to get involved, but this is really going to be an all hands on deck effort, um, you know, whether it is the policy side, whether it's the programmatic side, and we'd love to get your engagement. Thank you. Um, so I know we've got 15 minutes left. We want to make sure that we have time for answering some of the questions. Rahela, just, I'm going to go just straight to what can the church do to advocate for, um, you know, human rights in Afghanistan, for the rights of women and girls? Where do you see them playing a role um, and, and, and not just somebody in the United States, but also international organizations, because again, there's also a whole host of organizations that work on this, on, on uh, you know, in the UN system, for instance. But what can the church uh, do right now to sort of address this challenge? I will not go to the United States government straight forward to the church because uh, Chris has uh, covered it, but I would say immediate charter flight to, to help those who are exposed and 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 uh, women rights activists. But the uh, Episcopal Church, church uh, members can help uh, by keeping light in Afghanistan. We need uh, your members to raise uh, voices, to call out the atrocities to tell the world that this situation really is an unfolding human rights catastrophe that will lead to genocide, femicide, crime against humanity. And uh, this was avoidable. Don't make the slogan never again after atrocities in Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Holocaust, meaningless. Um, we also need uh, support to make specific ask of uh, your government, of uh, your leaderships, that the international community should take urgent steps to compel the Taliban to halt their uh, military offense, calling the UN immediate uh, restoration of sanctions of the Taliban uh, uh, until they end their offensive and uh, and asking the government to continue support women's defenders and uh, not to cut aid. Um, it's more important now than ever. Um, asking, uh, asking your uh, government to help evacuate and uh, fast track visa applications for the most exposed women at high level of civil society, private sector government who are certain to face it. In addition, many other right activists, women right activists at grassroots level who have been uh, trained by the U.S. or uh, work at the community level, uh, their real uh, location within the Afghanistan, uh, the region and uh, neighboring countries, the U.S. other uh, and other coalition country, uh, countries, uh, mainly in phases. Support to those in Afghanistan, strategic communications, women education and women empowerment, uh, and also the, uh, the church uh, can issue additional statements supporting Afghan who is, whose actions supported the Afghan government and general uh, tenets advocated by US and coalitions regarding rule of law and, and justice. Although the US military is leaving Afghanistan, USID, State Department and Voice of America can still support those remaining in Afghanistan by working with local partners and other uh, coalition nations. High priorities uh, advocates should include more emphasis on social media mechanism to provide credible information to Afghan people to counter Taliban uh, 
false hope and uh, promote unity and action within the nations. Empowerment through education for girls and women, uh, relocation support to those at high risk, and also the uh, uh, the church can do the. Uh, 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 can support these same objective by uh, partnering with local organizations such as we can be at help by uh, through GRA and Rahila Trust uh, to educate, empower, and enable remaining Afghans to take actions in support of a just and lawful country. And finally, the, uh, the church can uh, educate their members, uh, their membership about the plight of the Afghans and those who are victims of genocide, femicide, and to identify opportunities to offer their time, talents, and possibility, setting up a sponsorship as a pilot and then extend it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got more or less five minutes to go through some quick questions. Krish, they're mostly you know, addressed to you. Um, so, you know, two questions, I think, touched on this a, a little bit, which is um, anything that we can do to speed up the process of Afghan SIVs and are we shorting on housing on our end? Um, you know, and then I'm just taking a look and see if there's anybody else who kind of is acting kind of like these very nice technical questions. Um, let's, let's just do that for now. Um, and then, you know, I think uh, there's a few more points that we can make at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll answer the just the affordable housing question. Um, appreciate the clarification question. Uh, it is affordable housing on our end. Um, so the issue is, you, you know, you, you, some of you may be directly experiencing it just as buying a house is difficult to do or renting a apartment um, has become quite pricey. It is essentially priced out um, SIVs and refugees. And so one of the things that we are trying to figure out is how to ensure um, housing, especially during those first few months. Um, so if you have any uh, thoughts, maybe a property that might be available, um, we are also trying to be as creative as possible. So we've been having discussions around community co-sponsorship and is there a way that, you know, um, available housing, uh, you know, whether it's um, at, at a church or whether it is in, you know, um, you know, any inventory, if we could utilize it. So it is an issue of here um, in the U.S., in terms of what we can do to try to expedite, it is continuing to put political pressure. Um, if you look at historical precedent, we have undertaken massive operations to quickly evacuate our allies. As Chris mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, right? Um, when we were talking about the Vietnamese, we relocated 120 um, uh, uh, SIVs um, in, in short order. Um, so there is a way in which we can undertake this and still help save the lives of those who risk their lives to protect ours. Uh, but our elected officials need to know that this is of critical importance to us. And so, you know, making sure that you voice full-throated support for acting quickly, I think is critically important. Um, making sure that we highlight uh, the ability for our communities to absorb, um, you know, to help integrate these individuals, to help support them is obviously critically important. And so hearing from you in terms of your vocal support, I think is, is very valuable. But we also need to make sure that the president um, understands uh, that this is a key part of the drawdown. And um, we need to make sure that we act. We should have acted months ago um, as we were planning for this withdrawal. But uh, today um, is the time to try to remedy that that error. Yeah. One last question, and then uh, you know we're we're gonna pivot to um, Rebecca, the head of our OGR uh, team, right here. Uh, and you know, obviously, Ken Chuck has been linking out for EMM because um, I'm a policy nerd. Uh, and and how much would it cost a ch for a church to sponsor a refugee? That and so obviously in Canada you have the private refugee program. Uh, this this type of program doesn't really necessarily exist in the United States. So just a quick response to that question, um, kind of thinking where we can go from here, improving the refugee program. Yeah, so it, it's a great question, Chris. Because the funny thing is that the U.S. actually piloted 
uh, private sponsorship or community co-sponsorship, um, kind of the hybrid version, before Canada took that model and ran with it. And kind of we were left in the dust. Um, so we were heartened by the fact that President Biden did issue as part of a refugee executive order language on studying how this can help us build capacity. Um, so in terms of kind of how much this costs, honestly, even several hundred dollars, every single dollar helps, right, in terms of the effort. Uh, we have a program called Circle of Welcome, um, where kind of we partner with a congregation that wants to be involved directly in this work. And it, it was typically, I think, a, a, a 2,000 or a few thousand um, that a congregation needed to kind of uh, find and resources to partner with us. Um, but honestly, you know, we're trying to be as industrious as we can with what resources we have. Um, so kind of, you know, this is sort of a, a, a ongoing process. So with that, thank you, absolutely thank you to both our panelists for um, giving a, a sobering reality, but also a potential path forward to ensuring that um, we can all do our part to improve, uh, you know, a very dire situation. So thank you both. Um, and now we're just going to pivot back to our team for, uh, you know, wrap up uh, remarks and where we can go from there. Great, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Rahela. Thank you so much, Chris um, and Ken and Chris and Ken and Chuck for, for being um, on this webinar today and to all of you listening now or in the future. Um, you know, as has been said, this is an incredibly dire situation where we have uh, you know, a moral responsibility um, to be engaged, to be aware, um, to be doing all that we can um, to help address the situation, um, you know, catastrophic and, and tragic as it is. Um, and so I just want to, you know, again, lift up the work of the Fiscal Migration Ministries that along with LIRS and the other um, resettlement agencies are helping Afghans who are arriving in the US and other refugees, uh, helping asylum seekers. Uh, you know, we have a neighbor to neighbor program that helps congregations be able to um, partner and work with uh, asylum seekers. So we, there's possibilities for you to be involved, again, both on this particular issue and then more broadly in helping with the Ministry of um, Asylum Seekers and, and Refugee Resettlement and other issues relating to migration um, in the U.S. and really around the world as we also look at the Anglican Communion relationships, knowing that many of our Anglican Communion partners around the world are also facing uh, migration crises. Um, well, both with sending folks and receiving folks, and again, even those who are um, internally displaced. So we're, we're grateful for the opportunities um, that, that present themselves for us to be agents of response and, and take our, our call to witness and to, to stand alongside our Afghan allies um, seriously. So again, grateful for all of you being on. Um, you know, we will keep Afghanistan in our prayers um, and all of you for doing the work that you're doing as well, which is again, heartbreaking, heartbreaking work, but really vital and critical um, to be done. So just with many, many thanks um, for the time, uh, for the work, and please, please stay in touch, join our network, take, take opportunities like this to, to educate yourself and those around you so we can push the government to take action um, as soon as possible and in the most expeditious way, and that we can also help and respond to with love and compassion the Afghans who are able to come here. So thank you. Um, if there's any closing words, Chris or Ken, uh, Chris or Ken and Chuck. No, just thank you for hosting this webinar um, to the church. Thank you, EMM, to everything that you do to partner with LIRS and really grateful for all the attendees to join. Uh, Chris and uh, Rebecca for organizing this uh, such a end time event. Thank you so much. And I hope the process is going to be helpful and in time for, the, for those who are suffering in Afghanistan. Thank you all. And Ken and Chuck, over to you. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of you who have attended this important webinar. This is crucial work and you can be a part of it. So keep the advocacy going, find out what you can do on the ground. And as always, continue to pray. These are dire times, uh, incredibly difficult situations, but we can and must make a difference.
Thank you for joining us today.